Well, welcome. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. Good morning. This is the Market oh. Reset Show in our health segment, Wellness Lifestyle on Roku Television, Bloomberg Radio, WSTX Radio, that is, and Tampo TV. We are delighted to have not only you here today as our co host. How's everybody this morning? Great. Great, 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 great. great. But we have an awesome program today to talk about something very important and very significant, and that is the impact of sickle cell disease, not only within the communities of color, but economically within our country and with the impact onto our healthcare system overall. We have an amazing panel. It's kind of a historic moment for the health, wellness, and lifestyle segment of the Marketplace Reset because we've never had this many guests on at once. And so we're pretty excited. So we're going to talk about this important um, disease and issue that is very, very challenging in terms of treatment, in terms of clinical trials, <coughs> as I mentioned earlier, the economic impact. We have as our guest an amazing panel of women who have taken up the call and the banner as presidents of local chapters of a national organization called the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. Their hands and their reach within their local community expands not just hundreds of women, not just, it's more than just a hundred women that they reach through their local programming, <laughs> health, economics, education, and public policy, and advocating for black women and girls, but thousands of women collectively across the country. And they have decided to put on an amazing program on December the 4th, a webinar on sickle cell with a very esteemed um, panel, including our very own Dr. Donna Christensen will be on that panel. We are very excited about that. And so this is really historic because it's kind of the East Coast meets the West Coast. It is the West Coast chapters of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, and many of their presidents are represented on this panel today, as well as the Maryland chapters of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. So I tell you what, why don't we bring them on and let's get the conversation started. Let's, we're going to start with what is sickle cell. So one by one, we're going to be bringing them up. And we are just so excited and delighted to have each and every one of you amazing women here. We have, let's see, we have now coming up with from the Central Valley chapter, we have Francis Cohen, over in the Bay Area chapter. Ladies, wave when I say your name. So they we have Dr. Linda James, and we pulled her out of meeting with her patients. So she's so you see, she's going to be hopping out the program a little bit later on in order to go back to her patients. But Dr. James is from the Los Angeles chapter, and we have uh, Dr. Mountain, who is from Anne Arundel. One and second. Here she is. Okay, and we have Deborah Nixon Jordan from right here where myself, where I'm sitting in Prince George's <laughs> County, Maryland. Welcome. I'm going to need to call you back. Ooh, ooh. Yep, yep. She's a, she's I'm going to call you back. Dr. Thank James you. is already busy at her job, so we appreciate that. <laughs> yes, yes. Ladies, welcome to the Reset program on our marketplace, and we are very excited to have you here. Yes. Can everyone hear me? We're all doing great. Good. Wonderful. Um, we talk, just as we open up the program about the organization that you represent, the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, and that you've come together as presidents and uh, officers of your local chapter to collectively come together, a coalition of women who are representing advocacy for Black women and girls. And the, in this area of health, you've made the decision to talk about uh, the disease of sickle cell and um, all the facets of it. So why don't we get the conversation started with something that grounds us? And Dr. James, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to unmute your mic and just give us a little bit of what exactly is sickle cell disease? We hear a lot about it, but not enough about it. Yes, sickle cell disease is a genetic disease where the, um, the because of the genetic disease, the cells do not carry the hemoglobin well, and they'll change shapes. So when the cells change shape, they cause lots of problems in all of your organs. Mm. And, and so tell us a little bit, Dr. Christensen, I know that you've been involved also in Yvette 
in this clinical mm -hmm. aspect of treating di uh, excuse me, not diabetes, we've talked about that so many times, but <laughs> sickle cell. And, and why is it even called sickle cell? Kind of the layman's terms of why. Sure, based on the shape of the cell, it, instead of being nice and round as it should be normally, they form the shape that rep, kind of looks like a sickle and that's where the name comes from. Um, but it was the first genetic disease that was um, disease that we knew had a genetic cause and that you could follow the genetics. Uh, two people coming together, for example, with sickle cell trait, um, having an, a chance, uh, a one in four chance of having somebody, a child with sickle cell. And so you're saying that the red cell looks round, mm -hmm. but what happens is in the sickle cell trait and how it's been diagnosed is to see that it has formed, I call it a banana. Is that something, is that, is that inaccurate for the one, those mm -hmm. of us who are not clinical to understand sickle, I've never heard of that term, <laughs> but I see this kind of a banana shape. Okay. All right. Great. Mm -hmm. So I have a visual in hand. Um, okay. Yvette, I know that this is an area that you've been exposed to, obviously, in your clinical work as an, a registered nurse and uh, clinical administrator in the healthcare systems. You know, can you tell us a little bit of your experience with this disease in terms of your treatment and touch? Sure. Um, and I'm going to put a little personal touch on it, having um, had a sister who, who I've, I've recently lost had uh, sickle cell. And so it was the pain because as the cells sickle with their traveling, you know, through your, your veins, they, they clot up together, they stack up, they can't flow like regular round cells. The sickle, sh uh, sickle shape causes them to stack on top of each other, um, which causes excruciating pain yes. and growing up and watching her not be able to participate in just regular activities because of the pain. Um, was heart wrenching, and even though you know at that point in time it, there was a lot of you know pain medication given like there is today and infusion, but we've made so many strides, which I'm excited to hear the panel discuss all of the new techniques that are used to treat sickle cell um, these days because I'm I'm not quite up to date on it since her her passing, um, but back then I can tell you that it was just excruciating to watch someone suffer from sickle cell. And, and, you know, we, we're just so sorry to hear that because that is, you know, our heartfelt condolences because literally I think each and every one on the panel and the members of the organization and the leadership of the organization, the pres national president has put a call out there to raise awareness and be in the forefront of the discussion around sickle cell. So for our president panel, now any one of you can talk because I know that you are all remarkable dynamic women. So why don't we, let's do East Coast, West Coast. Why don't we start with East Coast and kind of talk to us about why is the National Coalition of 100 Black Women now involved in this discussion? What has been their um, um, response to it so far? And Deborah? Now, this is Deborah Nixon, uh, President of Prince George's mm -hmm. County, Maryland chapter. Um, this particular initiative, and we have to thank you um, sisters Wood, Christensen, and Sisters Dorman for allowing us this particular platform to work to raise awareness around the issue of sickle cell. At our last biennial, which is the policy making um, council for our organization, we literally passed resolutions, and one of those resolutions included helping to raise awareness around the inherited disease, sickle cell, sickle cell disease, sickle cell trait. Um, I think what, what stood out for me in terms of when we look at our advocacy on behalf of black women and girls and the men and boys that we care about within our communities, um, when they cited the statistic that one in 13 black Americans babies were born with the sickle cell trait wow. and about one in 365 are born with the disease. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, my, my head almost spun um, because I, I was shocked at that kind of prevalence. So yes. I re we recognize the need 
to truly continue to raise awareness around this issue. And again, thank you for this platform and thank you to the ladies of the East Coast and West Coast who came together as a collective to join our voices together to heighten the volume around the need for additional research and funding um, for a cure for sickle cell disease. That's very impressive that the national organization, um, President Dixon, Nixon Jordan, that's what I'm going to call you everyone with their presidency because you deserve that honor, um, that the national office of the organization would elevate its priorities to include a resolution, mm -hmm. um, a focus on sickle cell disease and sickle cell is the trait. And I think that's an important distinction so that we understand how and where treatment is applied and how do we um, begin to put the clinical trials in place that have already occurred and what those results are as communicating. But more importantly, where are we going in, in the future at this point in time? How do we get ahead of this? And is that even possible? And so let, let's, um, let, let's move to the West Coast. Um, Ms., uh, President Claybrooks. Oh, wait a minute, Dr. Mouse has a question. So we're gonna, Dr. Mouse, come well, on in. I, I just had, I'm sorry, I just had a, a short comment. The, the um, National Coalition of 100 Black Women advocates in the areas of health, education, and economic empowerment. And, and one of the things that we think about when we think about sickle cell disease is from the health aspects. <clears throat> I mean, that's the first thing I think about is the health aspects, but this is so timely right now. And, and so I also echo you know, what um, President Nixon Jordan um, said earlier, thank you for having us because now more than ever, it's a time to support patients mm -hmm. with sickle cell disease who face difficulties beyond the disease, but uh, many do struggle in the aspects of employment and their ability to work. Right. Oh. And so, so adults, for example, um, the unemployment rate is four to 10% of the population, but those with sickle cell disease experience a, a 28 to 52 percent um, rate in unemployment. So there are complica uh, complications, you know, that impact their livelihood. So the unemployment adds to the economic burden of even managing a chronic, you know, um, lifelong illness. That so is the pain that um, um, co-host um, Yvette spoke about with her sister, that pain, the more episodes that they have, the more um, difficult it is to work and the pain causes problems in, in their um, pro productivity. Their, um, they have work impairment, they experience negative impacts on social func functioning and sleep, you know, along with that pain. So this is definitely timely because it's so much bigger then, then the health aspect and the health aspect alone is huge. Mm -hmm. So, so I just wanted to piggyback have, on, yeah, on and, and I think your point is well taken, Dr. Mountain, that the organization itself, the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, actually will actually touch on this issue of sickle cell disease and sickle cell trait actually hits Absolutely. all of your thrusts, the education yes. thrust, the economic mm -hmm. empowerment mm -hmm. thrust, yes. the health awareness, obviously, thrust. And um, and I'm, I'm, I'm escaping the last thrust, but all, with each and every one of them. So, Dr. James, I know in a conversation yes. you and I had that you've actually treated in your work in um, Morehouse patients with sickle cell. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And I know you had a comment. Just just tell us what your thoughts are. Well, I think especially now when people are concerned about over treating pain and giving patients pain medications. These patients should not be in that barrel of limiting pain medication. And that's when you look at the health disparities, when you have more African-American people that um, are affected by this disease, over 100,000. In fact, the CDC does not even know how many people are truly affected with this disease. So I think it's extremely important that physicians are comfortable. Because if I had a cancer patient, I would not limit their pain medication. That would be cruel. But yet, that is done to sickle cell patients. But actually, that's run into problems in emergency rooms because people feel that they're um, clamoring for this 
for pain medicine that's not necessary. I think people think that they're addicted to the medication and they're, they're sometimes discriminated against when they seek um, care. But move on. Yes, I, I, that's a good point. So um, President Cohen. Thank you, thank you, Francis Cohen from the Oakland Bay Area chapter. And I wanna just touch on what um, Dr. Mountain was saying about you know, some of their issues. Some of their issues also lead to homelessness because they can't work. Mm -hmm. um, some of their mm -hmm. issues also lead to them not really having any medical insurance. Hence, they spend a lot of time going to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. And I, I also think that just having the resources, mm -hmm. you know, people think, okay, well, the hospitals have the other there has to be other community involvement besides just the fact that they go to the hospital. They do need, many of them, as I said, are homeless. I'm speaking from, from California and the, we're seeing more and more black girls with sickle cell. Wow. And, and when I say girls, uh, many of the many of the chapters for the National Coalition of 100 Black Women have mentoring programs for girls uh, 12 to 18. And I have to say, it's and when this resolution came out, we all were like, wow. Because sickle cell, as most of us know, is always on the back burner with the yes. CDC, with, mm -hmm. with research. Uh, with I read where, you know, in the 2019, they just came out with some new, um, some new medication. And they hadn't really done that in in years. So it's been on the back burner. I applaud, I really applaud uh, all of them. We are very fortunate in the 100 Black Women, as we said, we have we have some experts, medical experts in our area. Uh, in my chapter, uh, our health program, and I'm here because representing her, our health program, uh, our chair is a nurse practitioner at Stanford Health. And so she was able to, she just grabbed, she was so excited about this. And I thank you for this platform, mainly because we have now, we have a lot of work to do with this resolution. Mm -hmm. When it says one out of 13 black or African Americans are born. So we as black people know that. And for years it was never talked about outside of our own community. Right. And so thank, this platform is excellent because we now have to really get back to work. We have to advocate. We have to advocate and have programs going forward. Lots of hospitals have programs, I have to tell you. Let me just add one thing. Absolutely. Uh, uh, assembly, of, um, for you, Dr. James, you have in Southern California, so Oakland's in Northern California, Dr. James is in Southern California, and, um, and, and Ruth Claiborne is in Central California. But your assembly, Akilah Weber is the new assembly member uh, for a California, and she introduced a uh, sickle cell in early the, early this year. She introduced a bill to have a sickle cell month of September for the state of California. So that just happened last month was the first time that it was recognized, and so there were lots of activities around that. We do have an assembly bill that's been going back and forth, back and forth, uh, AB 1105. And that's when 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 the resolution came out, I, I went and I was like, we did have an assembly bill. We will now be, our public policy will now be focusing on that for the and, state. And I'm government. glad that you mentioned public policy because that was the other uh, thrust that I didn't mention earlier. So we're going to, let's talk about that. Let's talk about not only that kind of um, uh, public policy in its in place, but also we know that Senator Cory Booker and Senator Tim Scott and other legislators have really risen this up to that national viewpoint. And so why don't we take a quick commercial break and let's talk about that. We have lots to talk about um, getting into the detail and we wanna hear from President Clay Brooks when we come back. So um, we thank you very much for joining us uh, today on our health, on the uh, on our TV network on Roku. All right, so we are coming back. We are doing a quick break. We're going to add that in. And so we're really excited to have 
uh, the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, several presidents who are here representing their local area chapters from the California chapters to the Maryland chapters who have come together in coalition to host a very dynamic event on December the 4th, um, both East Coast, West Coast time. I think it's 10 o'clock on the West Coast, one o'clock on the East Coast. And so the subject matter is sickle cell disease, sickle cell trait as a national call to action. Um, President Clybrooks, can you share with us a little bit about that particular event that's happening on December 4th? Why and, and how would anyone register? Um, is it open? Is it free? Is it national? Is it local? Give us some detail. Hello, can you guys hear me okay? We can. Yes. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for having us. Thank you for having me. I thank uh, the California chapters uh, for inviting the Central Valley. As you know, we're, we're very new. And so we're still broadening our scope in health, you know, advocacy. <laughs> we're, we're learning and I'm so motivated and excited to learn more about sickle cells. Yes. First of all, um, I knew very little very little, but since this this uh, planning started for this event on December the 4th, I did reach out to family to find out um, who had, you know, knew anybody that either had had or uh, passed away from. And I learned just yesterday that I had a cousin, 22 years old, that after two, two, two days after his birthday, he passed away from sickle cells. And he had been suffering with it since he was three. He was in and out of hospitals, like I've heard you know, many of you say that happens. He was vomiting on trips, family trips, the airlift. I knew nothing about it until I asked. And so awareness is huge. And so what they said is he went to the emergency room and because like Dr. James's lack of knowing what to do, for a patient, especially African-American with probably little funds or, or medical care. Mm -hmm. He laid there for five hours and he passed away. Jesus. Five hours and he passed away. So I am just so super motivated behind what we're doing. Um, the December 4th webinar, we're gonna be addressing that disease, the sickle cell disease. That's what excites me because I love knowledge. And so patient disparities, you know, is in line with our advocacy, you know, to, to stop those damaging social economic disparities. So I'm just so super excited. And the last part of that is yes, it's free. Yes, yes, absolutely. Anyone can register, reach out. What, what we're doing is we're pasting this information, this flyer, this registration information on our platforms with uh, social media, our personal family, friends, so that all you got to do is stay plugged in and you'll learn how to, you know, get registered for this huge event that's coming up on December 4th. And, and yeah. registration, um, how do we register, ladies? If someone oh, register, registration is very, very simple. All they have to do is visit the website, ncbwsicklecell.eventbrite.com. N-C-B-W-S-I-C-K-L-E-C-E-L-L dot e v e n t b r i t e dot com there are some phenomenal ladies and gentlemen that will be on that webinar um from the black women's health imperative sister linda blunt who will be the the featured keynote dr salome weaver one of the prime researchers at the howard university college of pharmacy both focusing on sickle cell research. Uh, Dr. Terry Peters, who's from the Prince George's County, Maryland chapter, she's one of the few compounding pharmacists in this country and in the world. Um, mm -hmm. And she's with the Quality of Life Pharmacy and Health. That's Dr. Terry Peters. Um, Dr. Deborah Green, who's the Director of Health Education at the Sickle Cell Disease Foundation. She'll be given key background a patient advocate, Sister Charla 
Davis will be talking about her experience with sickle cell. And we have a 21 year medical practitioner and honorable Congresswoman Donna M. Christensen and in her medical capacity as a part of this webinar. And Sister, Sister, Sister Linda, Sister, <laughs> Linda James. Sister Linda James. Yeah, put your mute on. Um, tell, tell, tell them about our Van Vanderbilt. Yes. Oh, oh, there she is. Yes, hi. Thank you. Yes. So, Dr. Vanderbilt, um, which, excuse me, Dr. Michael DeBond, MD, MPH. He's a professor of pediatrics and medicine at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. J.C. Peterson, endowed chair in pediatrics, director of Vanderbilt Meharry Sickle Cell Disease Center of Excellence for over 25 years. Wow. So we're just going to do a collective wow. Right. That is a very esteemed, you know, congratulations, ladies, for putting yes this on for bringing this level of resource and excellence into the conversation and making it free of charge, free of charge, because you cannot get this kind of information in one place without having to sometimes pay a fee. But you, your organization is a national 501c3 organization, the National Coalition of 100 Black mm -hmm. Women. And can I just make a little quick disclosure? I keep saying your organization, but it's actually also my organization. Mm -hmm. I remember a new member of the organization, and I am so proud to be affiliated here in Maryland because I connect into an organization that actually is bringing the talk into the action. And it is making the moves necessary to advocate on behalf of women and girls and have been doing so since the 1980s. So we're very excited that we're touching thousands and thousands of women. I know there are hundreds who have already registered and there's space enough for each and every one of you who are listening and who are viewing. We're gonna just share that uh, uh, link a little bit later on in the conversation. We have about three minutes left before we get to our next uh, commercial break, but did you have something that you wanted to add, uh, President well, Jordan? Sister, Sister ah. Dorman, you, you, had, you had referenced um, a bill that that Senator um, Cory Booker and Senator Tim Scott did as a bipartisan bill that focused on sickle, on sickle cell um, sickle cell research, sickle cell awareness building, um, and and sickle cell and other charitable inheritable diseases. Senate Bill twenty four sixty five. Well, one of the things that I learned in look, just looking at that. Sickle cell is the number one inherited bloodborne disease. I mean, in 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 this country, and so the the need for the research, um, the need for the uh, attention to um, better management of the care of sickle cell patients is imperative. And it is an economic imperative um, because if I had to go to the hospital and stay two weeks at a time because I'm in the midst of back-to-back blood-based blood crises and in pain that whole period, that could be a medical catastrophe for me as a woman. And one of the things that I, I have learned is that one-fifth of women age 65 and old, older don't have a backup savings account for a medical catastrophe compared to, to one in a tenth of the male population. So the economic side of this um, that has been referenced, I mean, we really need to keep hitting at that because think about the, the question that says, how does this impact our larger community? Exactly. Um, and jump in, ladies. Help and, me. And I, you know, I just wanted to say, one, one one second. Second. I know that Yvette and Dr. Christensen chime yeah. in just a few minutes before the next commercial break, about two minutes. I just wanted to add Danny Davis' name to that because on the House side, Danny Davis has been very active for years. He, he's been championing sickle cell. That's all I wanted to add in. Yes, the Honorable Danny Davis out of Chicago, correct? Yes. Yeah, out of Chicago, because it's important that we recognize our legislators who are, who are bringing this up to that level of conversation and putting it into the legislative agenda. And what 
we can talk about, and I know Yvette, you wanted to say something. So let's let's end with your comments before we go to the break. I know you've been you've been eager. So I was yeah. okay. It might have to be answered right after the the break, Linda. But uh, I was listening to to Dr. Mountain speak, and you know, Dr. Christensen had talked about they think sickle cell patients a lot of times when they go to the ER they're drug seekers. Yeah. But what I wanted to bring up was the stigma that's associated with having a family member with sickle cell. For, for me, with my sister, at the time, she missed a lot of school. So the truancy officer was consistently showing up, wanting to know why she was not in class. And then you have the neighbors staring and, and people talk and there's a, there's a negative stigma associated with that. So I just wanted to ask the panel, um, what are we doing now so that families don't feel that anymore? Um, what uh, counseling is available? What support groups are available? What are the new initiatives to remove that stigma that if you have a loved one with sickle cell, it's no different than having anything else. You should not feel ashamed or feel like you have to hide that. That's a very good point, Yvette. I mean, because there is such a, a reverberating effect beyond the health effect. And I think Dr. Mountain brought that up very eloquently and you've given us some really food for thought of how that actually looks. Who would have thought when we're talking about children in particular, we talk about even sickle cell anemia, which shows up five months in a newborn and begins to process in that toddler and then that young child going to school, mm -hmm. that it's not just that they are not wanting to go to school, it's just that they cannot go to school. And then that caregiver, that mom, that dad, that grandmother, grandfather, that aunt, uncle, whomever is part of their network of care, then has to also make themselves available for supporting that person, that child as a caregiver. So at, in the same way that you, you know, with you, your experience with your sister, you know, someone had to take care of her. Well, that someone probably was a working employed individual and therefore mm -hmm. needed to have their job, needed to move forward and be in a position to, to, to generate the income for the family, but could not. So it's not just the individual, it becomes really the entire family. And so when we talk about the healthcare system, which we can talk about, um, I think we're getting ready to take a station break. If not, if not we're gonna keep on going. And uh, Anthony, our wonderful producer in the background. Yes. There we go. Yes. Take it away for our station break. Time. It has a different meaning in the U.S. Virgin Islands. It goes backwards, forwards, it stops. St. Croix is rooted in history. So much of it still remains untouched. I remember running on these streets as a kid. This trap was right down there. It opened the same year I was born. This is where the original Crucian hook was born. It's the symbol of these islands. And I wanted to have my hands in that very same history. I want to be able to pass it down to my family while still putting a new spin on it. The U.S. Virgin Islands, we have an amazing culture that developed over time from all over the world. St. John feels so untouched. Being underwater is like another world. There's no worries, there's no stress. I can just escape. This is my happy place. My passion for scuba diving came at just being fascinated with the water and wanting to be a mermaid. And this is the closest thing I can get to achieving mermaid status. <laughs> Canadians just love being outdoorsy. We live for adventure, so we love anything hiking, being on the water, diving, snorkeling, and St. John has it all.
It's like some spirit is protecting the island and keeping them raw. The Makujumbi watches over the island. From up there, they keep the evil spirits away. The nightlife in St. Thomas is absolutely amazing. There's always something going on. Everyone comes together to dance and catch a vibe. We're always celebrating. We celebrate freedom, culture, the food, the smell, the music. It's always a celebration. The people here are probably the most priceless thing because they keep the culture going. There's so many different influences on these islands. Food from all kinds of countries coming together in new <laughs> dishes. All of us came from somewhere, but all that we call this home. The VI is a new melting pot. This is where the past and the future comes together. Marketplace Reset Show, uh, our health, wellness, and lifestyle segment broadcasting on Our Health Network TV on Roku Channel, Tempo Networks, and WST um, X Bloomberg. We can look at this platform on our wonderful URL, which is ourtv.network. We have been talking with the presidents from the National Coalition of 100 Black Women representing our East Coast chapters in Anne Arundel and Maryland and several of our California chapters in Central Valley, Oakland Bay, Los Angeles, and uh, San Francisco was, uh, we hope we would show in, but she wasn't able to attend, but she's here in spirit. So when we broke for the commercial, we were talking about the economics. We were talking about the safety net issues around healthcare. We were talking about the extended family touch and impact of sickle cell disease and, sickle, and having a sickle cell trait on families. Let's. Let's give our listening audience and our viewers a little bit more of uh, a little depth on what can they do to address these health concerns in their families, in their communities, at state, local, and national levels. What can we say to give them something to hold on to if they're taking notes that they can implement uh, today? So let's start with Dr. Mountain. Now you're gonna to have to mute so we can hear your lovely voice. <laughs> there you go. So, so for us, for the Anne Arundel County chapter located in, in Maryland, um, we are going to focus on educating the public. So we'll be conducting webinars and, and having other panel discussions to educate, you know, on, on the uh, subject of sickle cell disease and, and what it entails. I mean, it's interesting that I didn't know too many people with the disease, but I do remember um, a few years ago, and he's still in the community, a child with sickle cell disease. And his mother used to always say, you know, he's having an episode. Um, and then recently, even last week, um, one of our, our mentoring women, we, we have a mentoring program, but one of the women has a child with sickle cell disease and he's three so i mean it is really more prevalent than we think and so we do need to educate the community and the public on the prevalence and what to do to help support 
you know, because we do need more places. We have places for uh, the multidisciplinary um, um, places for cystic fibrosis and um, what is the other one? Hemophilia, but not for sickle cell disease. So we right. definitely need to, you know, educate the public, take action, help where we can in raising funds and in supporting any of the bills that we have to support, you know, um, changing and 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 improving the lives of people through, you know, better treatment, more funding, etc. Dr. James? Yes, I think in addition to what Dr. Mountain said, I think um, for families, they need to go to their appointments with their family member who has sickle cell and also get in contact with like a sickle cell foundation where they can have support group to help them to maneuver through the medical field so they can get the services they need. For general public people that want to help with this situation, they can um, participate in research, bone marrow, they can donate bone marrow, things of that nature we can do as a community. So in, in addition to writing your congresswoman or congressman, mm -hmm. you can do those kind of things as well. That's really important. Dr. Christensen? Do each of your areas have parent support groups? We have a parent support group here that's very active. As a matter of fact, that's how I I'm involved here in the territory. Mm -hmm. Well, this is critical. You mentioned something. We talk about bone marrow. My goodness gracious. And then, you know, we talked a little bit before the break around uh, issues pertaining to one of the more severe cases of uh, sickle cell and that sickle cell anemia. We think about it as an iron deficiency, but it's something so much more. But before we really detail around the types of sickle cell with the time that we have left in the program, I know that um, you know each chapter that you represent of the National Coalition 100 Black Women in your communities are doing something. And I wanna give you an opportunity to describe that. So um, Deborah Nixon, can you unmic and let us hear your voice on what's happening succinctly in your area? Just a few, a few words. Well, number one, this kind of programming. Mm -hmm. um, number two, the coalition and collaboration between the East Coast, West Coast, on this particular issue. Um, we, we are also, just from looking at it and recognizing the lack of awareness as to resources, lack of information about the disease, it, it's important for us to, to do things like use our website to potentially put up a tip about did you know the, mm -hmm. there is a Maryland coalition and association for sickle cell that offers support group services um, and information that might be valuable to the, the the black black and Hispanic families in our area, and to cite some of those um, just little demographic kinds of details. Um, we are also looking at partnering with our, our sister um, state chapters mm -hmm. around initiating an, another, just a little fo focus group that is focused on the support groups. Prince George's mm -hmm. County has a support group association for sickle cell, but Anne Arundel support group for mm -hmm. sickle cell, Baltimore support group for sickle cell. Johns Hopkins has mm -hmm. a, 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 a whole little section that is focused on sickle cell research. But we want to look at, at urging support for clinical trial participation because that piece, that piece, not just in sickle cell, but in just about every avenue of medicine has an absence and a void of, of Black, Af African American, Hispanic presence. Mm -hmm. And the people of color are less well represented in the clinical trial experiments that lead to constructive medications being produced. And so encouraging, yes. encouraging mm -hmm. our community to participate in the <clears throat> cell trials, especially where they are populate where, where people have been diagnosed with the sickle cell disease, folks that have other some some um, pieces mm -hmm. 
some programs where it's focused on just the trait, but mostly it's I've seen where I've seen it, it's been focused on research around the sickle cell disease. And we, and we don't want to forget, and we don't want to forget in that clinical trial that we're talking both about uh, patients for those who, but we're also talking about involvement from our medical professionals in those clinical mm -hmm. trials. So it's really mm -hmm. important that we have a base of awareness and understanding of the treatment from those who are going to be providing that level of treatment, that they're also involved and sign up to be clinicians and support in those clinical trials. And I know that even Yvette, in your work that you do, you work extensively in the clinical trial arena. Um, and so that's really important. I want to give um, President Cohen and President Claybrook some opportunity to also share a little bit of what's happening on, in your, you know, what would you say, what are the top three, if you can do the, you know, the kind of the countdown, one, two, three tips that you're, a chapter in, in teaching, touching the women and, and girls and families in your community um, to talk about what they can learn from this conversation. Let me just mention that um, a number there are there are a, a number of organizations out here that are really nonprofits that will that are supporting today because there's you know they need volunteers. I, I think the most important, one of the most important is three things here is we have to now click our little heels and get out in our communities and start educating. We have to start educating people to what is available, what, what is available for them to use. That's the families um, and, and the patients. In California, I had the, uh, our health chair, I said, where, where are the numbers? In California, the highest counties is Los Angeles with sickle cell, San Bernardino, Sacramento, and Alameda, which is the county we live in, that I, Oakland is in. And so she talked a little bit about to me and she said, there are a number of programs, but she also talked about the fact that some people are not aware. So I think education is important. We have to get out into the community and start doing some volunteer work. I have to agree. Uh, with Dr. Nixon, George, we do have to start having webinars. We have to start making people aware aware of the programs. UCSF has a program. You know, Oakland Children's Hospital has a program. Who knew? In this in this bill that uh, you talked about, Dr. Nixon, Jordan, uh, the two four six five that was passed in in two thousand and eighteen. There's some pieces in here in the very last part of it about grants money mm. that are available i think that once and i i when i looked at it i said mm, we may want to look in that because these these fundings are should be available for the people the patients let me say yes. 400 million that these people are billed i asked her show me some real numbers emergency room visits okay in the last two years emergency room visits 400 million billed Wow. Who, pay for that? who pays for that? HMO don't pay for the whole thing. Some of it is self-pay, as, as many of you know. Some of these people no longer have jobs. Some of them can get Medicare, Medicare, you know, uh, those types. But some of them can't. Think of the ones that have to do the self-pay. So, so we, we have to get out into the community. And, 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 and your point is so very, very, very well taken because I used to work at a healthcare, in a healthcare system that was known as a safety net hospital, yes. not a private hospital, but a safety net in our community that was open doors to anyone that did or did not have the financial resources to yes. support. But we already know just because I didn't or that patient didn't have any financial resources does not mean that it doesn't get paid. It gets paid through our federal tax dollars. It gets paid through our state dollars. It is paid from you and I contributing into the healthcare financial system. And so we want to make it economically supported and continue to look for these grants, continue to be philanthropic and charitable in supporting these local based organizations, just like the National Council of uh, uh, National Coalition of 100 Black Women, so that you can continue to bring this kind of viable program and connect individuals to the resources. Um, very, very important. And to make sure that you're still advocating where others cannot advocate for themselves. Um, we didn't hear from uh, President Clay Brooks, and I want to make sure that you identify your chapter area. Give us just two big points or two uh, key points that you can share with us. And Jess, we just have a few minutes left in the program, and then we'll start to yeah. wrap it up. 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, I just piggyback on all of the great wealth of knowledge that I'm hearing here and where we're going with this because resources must be made available. And because we're so new at this, I don't know if this has been done before, you know, throughout the history of National Coalition of 100 Black Women, but what I'm learning about sickle cells now, we do need to get out here and seek and seek and seek. They say seek and you shall find. I will be meeting with our health chair and we are going to start looking for the resources and finding who is affected, the support groups, how we can shine a light on this, this topic right here. So that's where we are. Outstanding. Well, Dr. Christensen, oh, doc, uh, you gotta yes. unmute, unmute yourself. You, you, you said something that triggered something when you talked about um, the, the pharmaceutical department. We, we were approached by, I want to say it's the Historically Black Pharmaceutical Association. I think it's the National Pharmaceutical Association. Um, mm -hmm. And they are cooperating with us and they're going to be sharing this with the pharmacists and mentee pharmacists, mm -hmm. or the pharmacists in training and encouraging their participation in the December 4 wow. programming. Um, and, and the regional rep contacted me on that. And I think they may be interested in being a, a, a co-sponsor for the program. But additionally, we each might want to seek out those regional reps. And I'll make sure that from the contact that I, I initially had, that everybody gets that. We might want to seek out an opportunity to do something with them because they, they, they're at the forefront of the medications. Mm -hmm. um, and right now there are probably about 17 medications that are in the pipeline of research, still doing clinical trials and that kind of thing, which still says there are really basically only four medicines for sickle cell that are being used. And those are the four that they had 40 years ago. Wow. Um, so, ones. Sister Cohen, that, that grantsmanship piece that you talked about, uh, we ladies might need to be having another kind of a collective discussion. Well, you know, let me just put it out there for you. Let me put it out there for you. Those who are listening and who are viewing in, you have here five of 60 chapters that are represented across the country under the umbrella of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. It started out with 100. It has now evolved into thousands of women who are putting together their collective voice. And so we want you to consider joining this important program on December the 4th and being in a position to actually um, listen in, write notes, determine what you can do in a response in your local community as an individual health consumer as a family member to someone that you know, as in a government, a local elected official, or really just as an advocate for improved health across the country. Whatever your role may be, collaborate. Uh, pick up the phone and call any one of these particular chapters who are represented here. And before we get off, I want to make sure that each and every one has an opportunity to reintroduce yourself and your chapter because you're doing phenomenal things. And we appreciate that. We have about five minutes left. We have some good time to talk about one other thing that I think is really important, and that is making sure that individuals understand why they need to be evaluated. There are three areas that they need to get their numbers and know their numbers. Dr. James, I know that you're chatting because Dr. James, see, she is a dynamic woman. She has been on the program and doing the work with her patients all at the same time. But, but Dr. James, and 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 and, he, and Dr. Christensen and, and, and registered nurse are in about that clinical piece. What do we need to make sure an individual who is thinking I have the trait, or they know they have the trait, but they have not gotten tested? Because we we know that we have an ab, a patient advocate on the program that's coming on December the fourth, a webinar whose family did not recognize that the pain that they were experiencing was attributable to having the sickle cell disease and sickle cell trait. 
what do those individuals need to know and how do they communicate that information to their doctors? Yes, they need to go to their doctor and explain what's going on with them and then they can ask for a test. And all, all babies that are born in the United States get the sickle cell test. So um, that's how we're finding out the, the numbers are so high for African-Americans as well as Hispanic patients. Interesting. There are also genetics counselors that, um, because we have to think about when you're getting married, are, 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 you both of, are both of you carrying the trade or, you know, what, what is your uh, situation re regarding sickle cell and genetic, genetics counseling is also another important okay. aspect of care. Dr. Christensen, you just blew my mind with that. I've never heard of the concept of genetic counseling. Mm -hmm. And so for the lay person, is that something that I would, you know, Google and say, I think I need genetic counseling, or is it because I know that sickle cell has been in my family at some point in time and I need to make sure that I do not carry the trait? Yeah, a simple blood test could can help with that. But um, one of my da daughter's best friends is a genetics counselor. And mm -hmm. today with we have the genome having been um, identified, mapped out, more genetic diseases are being um, treated in one way or another, including sickle cell. There's a lot of research on genetic treatments for sickle cell. Um, so there's a lot of work for genetics counselors. So yes, you can seek them out, but uh, especially if if you know that you have the trait. Especially. So even I just, I just, wanted to jump in jump in on that because I can remember as a as a child my cousin's his cousin Stanley <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how cousin Stanley sounded when he was in a crisis y'all wow and he he had sickle cell disease and my mother trying to explain to me dr Christian um well, Uncle Lim had the had the trait, and Aunt, Aunt Helen had the, the trait, and between the two of them, that's why how Stanley's got this disease. Um, and mm -hmm. it was about if, if they had talked to, if they had had the blood test and did the marriage counseling, they had a decision to make: um, mm -hmm. do we want to have children or, or not? Because um, if both of them had the sickle cell trait, it was like a twenty five percent chance that. Their, their 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 child would have the sickle cell disease but if one of them had had sickle had the sickle cell disease then the kids definitely would have had the trait at least and if especially if the other other partner didn't have the disease but th those kind kind of crises um mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're harrowing because his sisters and brothers, he had three sisters. Um, they were always worried about of course. Stanley. Of course, of, of, of course, because that brings in a whole nother conversation associated and that's the, the response and mental health of those who love and care for someone as Yvette shared with us with her sister. And, you know, and frankly, as a parent, I would be mortified to know that my child that I've pass that, that trait on to my child who is now suffering or the disease that that child is now suffering. So the genetic counseling is really critical and very important to uh, consider and ask whether you believe that you need to or not. It's a good conversation to have with your primary health care regardless. There may be other health issues that a genetic counselor would be an appropriate response. I'm hearing from the esteemed panel that we need to make sure that you get yourself evaluated, a blood test. And Dr. James said a simple blood test. So we're not talking about something super complicated here and making sure that you have your numbers, know your red blood count, correct? So if they have a lower red blood count, we've got, and we have sickles, um, which is that banana shape, you've got some challenges ahead of you, some treatment um, plans that need to be put into place for your health. Um, know your hemoglobin. You know, no, well, you gave me the terminology, the Rika, uh, Dr. James, you gave me that, you gave me that name. Reticulocyte. Reticulocyte, right, that's one of the ones. We'll repeat that one more time. Reticulocyte. 
reticulous sites, very important. Those are the three main evaluations that you need to know your numbers for. And then I'm hearing from this esteemed group that it's important to know your local your local legislation. I think yes. that Dr. Co um, um, President Cohen gave us some very good examples of what's happening in her community and how those local um, decision makers, elected officials, mm -hmm are putting their arms around this issue and bringing it to the legislative area. So arena, so that funding can in fact be released to support clinical trials. And speaking of clinical trials, I think we all can agree that we must all show up in a clinical trial. Um, I know that for myself, I've been afraid to be involved, but what I'm hearing is we have to get over that fear because there's something mm -hmm. critical and important that we must engage in. And that is being a part of these clinical trials, particularly as people of color. So that is yet another trait. And then when you have the opportunity, get the information from all the organizations that are dedicated to sickle cell uh, disease from a funding research uh, from an awareness perspective, whether they're advocacy and lobbying groups, they are out there. They're part of the medical school systems in our country. You mentioned uh, Nixon Jordan, that there is the John Hopkins of the world, John Hopkins mm -hmm. University Global. There's Howard University Global. It's really important. Meharry. Meharry University. These are formidable universities in the United States of America. And there, there are many more that we haven't named that are very, very invested into this clinical research and awareness. And so then join organizations like the National Coalition of 100 Black Women who at the chapter local level have made a commitment based on the call to action through the national resolution that you've shared with us earlier today to become a part of the conversation. So on December 4th, uh, this coming December 4th at 1 o'clock East Coast time, 10 o'clock West Coast time, there is the conversation, Understanding Sickle Cell. And we invite all of you to join because it's a free webinar. And you gave the event. I'm going to give it really quickly. It's NCBW Sickle Cell dot Eventbrite. And that's B-R-I-T-E dot com. Yeah. So go on. And you can register and you will be a part of that conversation in a very, very fascinating and very, very important way. Um, Yvette Wood, our co-host, I know that Dr. Christensen had to make it out because she's got a lot of critical things to do. Um, but we are so grateful for all of you being here. So our co-host, our registered nurse, Yvette. Ladies, I am so impressed and I, I would say, Madam President, but you will all answer me. So <laughs> <laughs> I say, Doctor, you will all answer me. So me. Like, whoosh, to be in the room with such intelligent, bright sisters, I, I am honored to be in, in your presence. And I've learned so much from you. And, and I wish you well on, on this endeavor. I just I'm so impressed that I'm honestly overwhelmed. And God bless you all. And thank you so much for sharing. I learned so much from each and every one of you. I feel like a kid in a candy store to be here. Thank you. And that's really saying something because we usually learn a lot from Yvette being at the bedside and being in the clinical <laughs> trial space and along with Dr. Christensen. And so, ladies, we are so excited that you have joined us today for this program, our health, wellness and lifestyle program, segment number one on the Marketplace Reset. Um, we are very excited for our viewers and our listeners to be able to watch this program on our TV.networks network. Um, multiple times. It will be, it will live there for some time. So you can go back and refer to it. But next week on the program, we will have a, again, representation from your local chapters of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. It will be your health chairs, the chair women who head up and are boots on the ground, who are developing the programs, who are implementing the programs, who are talking to your constituents and bringing forth that opportunity to collaborate. So we're excited about that conversation and we look forward to having um, a more robust conversation as well at that level of, uh, of detail. So 
We ask that each and every one of you have a, a great holiday, a Thanksgiving Day holiday. And we, we actually pray for each and every one of our listeners and viewers who have members of their family or if they themselves um, are uh, with sickle, have sickle cell disease or know within their family they have sickle cell trait. We are going to support you and we have your back. And we thank you for being a part of this conversation. Ladies, I think that's a wrap. Unless anyone else, you want to just quickly just say one more, anything else? Well, on behalf of all of the California chapters and the uh, East Coast chapters in collaboration with this event, we would just like to thank you for having us and thank you for spotlighting our program coming up December the 4th. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. So everyone have a great day and we look forward to um, keeping the conversation going. Continue to do that work in your communities. Have a good afternoon.